Amaranth is located in the southeastern Arizona lands where the Otham, Hopi, Ashwi, and Apache families lived for untold generations and whose wisdom and traditions live on today in vibrant communities. We are grateful for all of the, these communities, their rich history, what they have to teach us. Thank you to our members and donors <clears throat> who enable Amaran to provide free online programming and fulfill Amaran's mission to promote the knowledge and understanding of the native peoples of the Americas through research, education, conservation, and community engagement. To learn how you can assist Amarin in supporting its mission and programs by becoming a member or donor, please visit amarin.org. As a reminder, the Amarin Museum is open to the public with safety protocols in place, such as requiring the use of masks and social distancing. To plan your trip to Amarin, please go to the visit section of our website, amarin.org. <clears throat> On Saturday, May 8th, Amarin will have a free online documentary viewing and panel discussion of Parched, the Art of Water in the Southwest. This special two-hour program will begin at 10 a.m. with a showing of a documentary, followed by a Q&A panel discussion at 11 a.m. Please visit the events section of our website, amarin.org, or the events section of Amarin's Facebook page for registration details. Then on Saturday, May 15th at 11 a.m., Amarin will host a free online program, Wedding Clothes and the Osage Community, a giving heritage with Dr. Daniel Swan and Osage community member, Renee Harris. Please visit the events section of Amarin's website, amarin.org, or the events section of Amarin's Facebook page for registration details. All right. Uh, Dr. Steve Lexon recently retired as curator, curator of archeology span at the Natural, Museum of Natural History at the University of Colorado at Boulder. He received his PhD from the University of New Mexico and directed more than 40 archeological projects throughout the US Southwest, mainly in the Membris and Four Corners areas. Lexon's publications include a dozen books, many chapters in edited volumes, and articles in professional journals and popular magazines. <clears throat> His works include the books A Study of Southwest Archaeology, Chaco Meridian, and A History of the Ancient Southwest. And if you would like to ask a question during our program today, please type your question in the Q&A chat box and we'll gather those questions to share with Steve at the end of his presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Steve. Uh, can you hear me now? I sure can. Okay, I will do the share screen thing. Let's see if we can make that work. And there we go. Um, okay, well, thanks to everyone, or thanks to Amarin for inviting me to give this presentation, and thanks to everybody for taking part of their Saturday. Um, title of this is What Was Chaco Really? Uh, which sort of implies that I know what Chaco was. And I wouldn't be that arrogant, but I, I think I have a pretty fair idea of what it wasn't and which trees to bark up to find out what it really was. Um, Chaco is presented as a, in, actually both in the professional literature and in the popular literature as a big mystery, the mystery of Chaco Canyon. Uh, which is embarrassing for me as an archeologist and it should be embarrassing for all archeologists because we've been working out there for over a hundred years and we've spent millions and millions of mostly your dollars, uh, a lot of energy and brains and smart people working out there. Um, and the archeology span is quite easy uh, compared to like Holocom or compared to like working in the Near East. I mean, you, you can see almost everything on the surface. You can walk into the buildings at Chaco. It's not like, the, like Holocom archeology, span uh, which is under Phoenix, under the city of Phoenix. That's difficult. Um, Chaco's archaeology is easy. It's you know about the best dated uh, um, archaeology archaeology going to find around the world because it's just thousands and thousands of tree ring dates that are very precise dates. So this is embarrassing. Why is Chaco a mystery after you know like I say about you know a century, or millions of dollars, lots of people working out there, and an archaeology which is not all that challenging. Um, I would say that it's a mystery because of the combined effects of ethnology, which is the old term for cultural anthropology. That's how anthropology in, the, in America actually starts ethnology, uh, describing the native tribes. And upstreaming, which I'll explain in a minute, but it, it basically means 
He's going from modern Pueblos back to Chaco and forcing what modern Pueblos, what we think they do on Chaco because it doesn't work. Santa Fe, which is all marketing, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and I can't see the bottom of my screen. So right now I can't tell you what the fourth one is. <laughs> uh, let me look over here. Oh, Fred Harvey, Fred Harvey. It actually turns out it's Ford Harvey. I'll explain the difference uh, in a minute here. But uh, the commercialization of the Southwest, the creation of a, a tourist mecca, all those combined to make Chaco mysterious. Now, ethnology starts really in the uh, United States uh, with Lewis Henry Morgan, the guy in the upper left who legitimized anthropology. He got it in the National Academy of Sciences, got it recognized as a science. And while he wasn't a professor, he was very influential. And he insisted that the only way to know the past is what he called the ethnological method, which is going from what we know about present tribes, the ethnology of present tribes, and um, puzzling out what was in the past that would lead to that present, sort of like a, a linguist uh, reconstructs a proto-language. Um, uh, there are serious problems with that, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, he also announced dogmatically that there were no what he called civilizations in the new world anywhere, which by which he meant what we today would call states or empires. Um, he, you know, he blew off the Aztecs. He said that was all just Spanish hyperbole, and certainly no, no civilizations, no states, no, you know, political systems, uh, north of Mexico, and that stuck. And he says this, you know, in the late 1880s, and uh, the few anthropologists at the time, they agreed with that, and they taught that to their students, taught that to their students, taught that to their students, and the guys, the professors that taught me. And it's, it's so ingrained in American archaeology at this point that there's no states north of Mexico, that it, it just seems a ridiculous thing to raise um, as a possibility. Uh, Adolf Bandelier uh, was Lewis Henry Morgan's, you know, he did, Morgan's not a professor, he didn't have students, but Bandelier was his student. Um, uh, Morgan mentored Bandelier and shoved that down Bandelier's throat too, the ethnological method, no civilizations. Bandelier got sent out to the Southwest by the Archaeological Institute of America uh, back in the days of the Apache Wars, it's really interesting. Um, to evaluate whether the Southwest was actually Aztlan, the home of mythical home of the Aztecs, which is what people thought at that point. These stone ruins, these empty cities uh, in the Southwest were where the Aztecs came from. And Bandler said, no, you know, these, these are local. There's no Mexico up here. And he basically said there's no history. You know, his conclusions to his two-volume report on his researches in the Southwest said, you know, that there was just a steady, tedious progression from simple, simple people up to Hopi, or up to Zuni, or up to Akama. Okay, now Edgar Hewitt, whose name's going to come up a lot here, <clears throat> who founded the Museum of New Mexico and uh, founded what later became School of American Research, now School of Advanced Research, he was a big fish in a very small pond of southwestern archaeology. <clears throat> Edgar Hewitt was Bandler's student and a very, well, me well mentee. Bandler mentored Edgar Hewitt. And Hewitt bought into all this stuff. To his dying day, he was, you know, he was a, Mor a confirmed Morganite. He worshipped Morgan. And so there are no civilizations, and the ethnological method was the way to go, even though we went out and dug up a lot of uh, uh, sites. But the you know, function of archaeology uh, for all these guys is just to put pots in the museum. You know, they're going to do the, the historical work, such as it was, um, you know, through the ethnology. So upstreaming. Uh, this is not exactly what Morgan had in mind for, for the ethnological method, but it's the way that it's been interpreted, you know, after decades in the Southwest. And this is touted as one of the strengths of Southwestern archaeology is you have the living civiliz you know, living societies uh, that you can model the past on. In this case, the Pueblos, that's a, uh, a Fred Cabote painting, a uh, Hopi guy, Hopi artist of some renown, painting of a sort of generic Rio Grande Pueblo. And what archaeologists have done since day one is literally take what was going, what we are allowed to know, what we think we know about modern Pueblos, and just glue it on the past. If you wanted to know, um, you know, what you did, you went and talked to an Indian. And here's Neil Judd, who excavated Pueblo Benito with his friend Santiago Naranjo from Santa Clara, I believe. It's in Old Right now, I can't remember. Uh, one of the Rio Grande Pueblos. Uh, and Judd would go out and dig in Chaco, and he'd have Indians out there with him. But he, he'd also go confer with these guys and say, you know, what, what is this? What is that? And they're being polite people. Santiago would tell him something. Um, Edgar Hewitt, same thing. He's in thick with a lot of tribes, and I'm not sure who that is. It's probably Taos, I don't know. Uh, tribes with there's Edgar um, in the uh, courtyard, I believe, of the gov Palace of Governors at Santa Fe. Uh, but he, he, and many archaeologists cultivated Pueblo friends 
to help them write their archaeology, which made the archaeology pretty easy. You didn't have to think about it. So Santa Fe in 1882, this is when Hewitt is arriving there and building institutions, it was a capital of New Mexico. And that's about all you could say for it. I mean, otherwise it's dirt streets and mud houses and there's an absurd uh, cathedral way out of place. And some Victorian stuff that, you know, after we, after we took the Southwest from Mexico, uh, people sort of imported uh, Victorian styles to Santa Fe. But it was, it was the capital and that was it. Uh, the actual bustle and hustle was down in Albuquerque. They had the university, they had the industry, they had the railroad. The Ashes and Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad did not go to Santa Fe. Why would you? Um, you know, nothing there. And at one point there's a move uh, in the legislature to, to shift the capital from Santa Fe, the function, the capital and its functions from Santa Fe to Albuquerque because Albuquerque was the progressive happening place. Um, and Santa Fe didn't like that. So they mustered their forces. Uh, Hewitt was a leader in all this, mustering the forces. And I should say, this is get to Chaco pretty quick here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's an empire builder. He did not want Santa Fe, you know, he had, this is adopted home at this point. Uh, he didn't want the capital shift. And, there, you know, there's a, a gang of about 12 mostly white guys, but some of the old uh, Hispanic families, too, in Santa Fe that said, well, you know, we got to fight this. Uh, we can't fight Albuquerque with knowledge because they got the university. Um, Santa Fe opted to get the penitentiary, not the university. That shows you how they were thinking um, when they were divvying up the, the uh, territorial spoils. Well, fight them with culture. Because, you know, we're the oldest capital in North America and Albuquerque was nothing. It was a little little farming town until the railroad came through. So here it could go either of two ways. He could, he had the Spanish culture, which he greatly appreciated, or Native American. And he initially tried Spanish and they revived the fiesta and they, you know, pitched the romance of the conquistadors and all that stuff. And nobody cares. Nobody in the East Coast, the West Coast cares. I mean, if they want to see that kind of stuff, they got colonial uh, um, Florida, and then they got the mission churches in Southern Southern California. They don't, they don't, why would you come to Santa Fe to see that? So he drops back, he and his pals drop back 10 yards and say Indians. And what we got, you know, maybe not Apaches and Navajos because we're just fighting wars with them, but the Pueblos, the Pueblos, and they they go Pueblo, go full on Pueblo. And Santa Fe now is it's like a Pueblo theme park. Um, I mean, it's still very much with us. So Fred Harvey picks up on this, the Fred Harvey Company, started by Fred Harvey, is really his son Ford Harvey, who uh, did not rename the company because uh, it had name, you know, Ford is a smart boy. Uh, Fred Harvey had name recognition for working with the Atchison Topeka and Santa Fe with their restaurants and, and hotels and stuff. But Ford really goes all out on Southwest. And that's when you have the Indian detours and, you know, just publicity from coast to coast about what a unique uh, society Pueblos were um, and the Navajos and the other Native American people in New Mexico. But, you know, mainly Pueblos. Uh, there's a smiling Hopi girl on a Fred Harvey, Ford Harvey um, postcard. So Pueblo space, all this creates what I'm calling Pueblo space. Um, and it has many fathers and mothers. It has architects and writers. And there's Ford up in the upper right there. Uh, uh, journalists like Charles Lamas. Uh, archaeologists like Ken Chapman, who couldn't decide whether he's an archaeologist or an artist and didn't make much difference in Santa Fe. And, and of course, the artist, the art community and Mabel Dodge Lujan was sort of the, uh, the Taos art community, but there's a similar one in, in uh, bigger maybe in, in Santa Fe. They all create Pueblo space, which is codified by Ruth Benedict, who's a straight up ethnologist, cultural anthropologist by this time, uh, and kind of dropped the ethnology label. But she wrote a book called Patterns of Culture. Uh, it was an enormous international bestseller. Where she talks about four different cultures, and this is basically a psychological analysis. But her, her depiction of Zuni is the archetypical Pueblo space, uh, which is something like this. It, you know, the Pueblos are independent villages. They don't have an overarching government system. And they're isolated and inward looking. You know, they aren't really interested in the outside world. And they're egalitarian. You know, there's no boss. I mean, there are obviously bosses, but they, you know, they, they you can't run a town like that in, or, or an irrigation system without having somebody in charge, but it rotates and you, you do it as a civic duty. You aren't making money off being the boss. And so they're egalitarian. And they're very communal. Everybody pitches in for everything. And of course, you know, cue the flute music. They're all spiritual and ritual. It's all about ritual, all about religion and, and spirituality. And for the, you know, the Pueblos that, uh, she knew, uh, yeah, that's certainly true. Uh, by the time she gets to the Pueblos, I mean, we've taken all their land. We try to re eradicate their languages. We sent their kids off to boarding school. Uh, it destroyed their economies. I mean, 
it's not like religion is all they had left, but that was you know the thing they could claim as their own. So that's public space. That gets in the, in the marketing for Santa Fe in you know internationally in popular writing, and it's in archaeologists' heads. The archaeologists have this kind of vague notion that this is what's appropriate for the Southwest for places like Jocko. Uh, Gordon Vivian was the park archaeologist. Uh, he's effectively the park archaeologist out there. Uh, some of you may know his son, Gwen, uh, who grew up out at, at Chaco with his father, Gordon. Uh, and in, by the 1950s, by mid-century, Gordon had figured out that there was something wrong with that picture, that, that Chaco wasn't going to fit in Pueblo space. He excavated King Quetzal, which is the, on the right, and wrote a, a wonderful uh, 1964 a synthesis of Chaco archaeology, which the academics subsequently overlooked for some reason or other. You know, you had them complaining that we don't know anything about Chaco, and you know, here Gordon had got their work done. And his conclusion, and then, I'm sorry, but you have, I'll read it. Um, this is his conclusion in 64, actually written about 10 years earlier. The developments in Chaco were not in the direct line of the Pueblo continuum. The continuation of the direction taken by Chaco would have carried it even farther out of the stream of development that culminated in the Rio Grande Pueblos. Ever increasing control, specialization, and centralized authority was not compatible with the basket maker Pueblo continuum. He's referring to the, the Pecos system. And Gordon's saying, no, nah, you know, Chaco's not going to fit in Pueblo space. But we still try desperately to keep it there. Even if we can't make it a pub, make it a valley full of Pueblos, and there's some people that want to. They want it to be a, a valley full of little farming villages that fit that you know, original conception of Pueblo space. If that doesn't work, then we make up stuff that makes us think that it fits in Pueblo space. What Pueblo people think about this, like pilgrimage centers and ritualities, what they think about that, I have no idea. I actually do. I've talked to a few. They just sort of snicker. Um, so, you know, in, initially the reaction is to try and turn it into a valley full of Chaco Canyon, into a valley full of independent, you know, Pueblo villages. The Chetraquetl is one town, and Benito is another, and Alto, Pueblo Alto is another. I'm not referring to the, the big ruins in the central Chaco. Um, that doesn't work on many fronts. <laughs> but, you know, just for starters, Chaco has a region. I mean, this is stuff that we've learned in the last 20, 30 years of, uh, that incorporated most of, all the four, most of the four corners all the way down the Mugio Rim, practically, and over to Flagstaff and, you know, east, not quite to the Rio Grande. It's interesting. Um, that's marked by uh, all those little red symbols, the, the triangles, the squares, the circles. Those are small versions of Pueblo Benito. Uh, the contrast, and I'll show you this in a minute, contrast dramatically with what normal people are living in. Um, normal people are living in, in clusters of, of houses around each one of those red symbols. Um, that's, you know, 30,000 square miles with a clear center. Uh, you have roads, I'll talk about roads in line of sight later, that, that pretty clearly show that, that Chaco is a center in some sense to this large region. Okay, Pueblos don't have that. I mean, there's, you know, there's not one Pueblo in Rio Grande that's calling the shots for all the other Pueblos or even remotely uh, the, the center for other Pueblos. And certainly in Pueblo space, everything's independent. And this is not, this is a region with a, a structure, a, a settlement structure. You know, you know the Pueblo, trying to make Chaco into a valley full of Pueblos, just, it's, a, it's a non-starter. I mean, there's nothing like this in, in Pueblo space. You know, Pueblo space does not equal, does not include, you know, a center, a capital in a, in a region. It's just not going to work. So let's forget about that. Uh, and the archaeologists realize that, you know, that's 30 years of documenting that, that uh, 40 years of documenting that region. So one of the fallbacks was a pilgrimage center. And the chocolate was actually empty most of the time. And every once in a while, uh, you'd have a mass pilgrimage up those roads from all those outlier sites uh, into Chaco and everybody do whatever they want to do. Um, uh, and this is Kim Melville, he's my colleague here at University of Colorado, and Jim Judge, who I used to work for uh, in the Park Service, kind of ran with this. And it had some currency for a while. Uh, people have gotten, people meaning archaeologists, have kind of gotten away from it because it's extraordinarily unlikely. I mean, we have these kind of mass pilgrimage sites that Kim Melville studied in, in India, uh, or, you know, that's Mecca in the upper left. And usually, not just talking about state level society, you're talking about empires, uh, and you're talking about places that could actually house and feed and you know water for these people. Uh, and Chaco has none of that. But not that we need to be limited by what modern pueblos do, but modern pueblos certainly have pilgrimages, but it's not people coming into the pueblo, it's a few people going out from the pueblo. And this is another Fred Cabote 
it's a wall mural, uh, I believe, at Painted Desert, uh, one of the old hotels in, in Painted Desert um, Park Service facility now, of uh, a salt pilgrimage uh, from Hopi down to Zuni Salt Lake up at the top and back again. It's just a couple of guys. And that's what, you know, Pueblo pilgrimages are small groups going out to the Pacific Ocean, going here, going to this mountain, going to that mountain, doing what Pueblos do. I mean, I'm not a Pueblo person. I'm not sure what that's all about, but that's, that's pilgrimage in, in modern Pueblos. So we drive back 10 yards it can't be a pilgrimage center and it's not going to work as uh, farming villages we'll make something up it's a rituality it's a rituality something new under the sun and this is my old friend uh norm yaffe who borrowed it from somebody else but he, he popularized the notion of a rituality i mean what's a rituality i don't know a locus of high devotional expression that was colin renfrew who's an incredibly smart and important uh, british archaeologist as is norm is uh, not a british archaeologist but incredibly smart uh, they said, well, you can't explain it any other way. It's it's religion. And that gets us out of thinking again. Not not uh, not those guys, they're thinking all the time. But but you know, if you say it's it's religion, then we it's inexplicable, we don't have to worry about it. And you know, only religion would would build chocolate. And certainly the things we would call religion were certainly a part of the mix, but I, you know, I think there's parts of chocolate we can understand without uh, waving feathers. One of, one of the problems with that for me are one of these things. That's Polo Benito. Okay, if it's a rituality uh, or a pilgrimage center that's you know entirely or not centrally driven by by religion, what what are these big buildings? I mean, they're not temples, you know, they're they're not temples. Um, they're houses, great houses. We call them great houses because people lived in them. Turns out, not many people. I'll get to that in a minute. And they're very special people. But you know, it, it, the whole issue of Chaco are these big buildings out there. And I'm not sure the rituality helps us understand the big buildings. You know, if you had a bunch of great kivas or something out there or a pyramid, maybe, but these are houses. So keeping Chaco in public space, people try still are trying to turn them into farming villages. There's still a, a contingent that wants to go that route. Uh, pilgrimage center is not dead. That's what you usually hear from the park service at this point. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's on life support among archeologists, but it's not dead. And rituality is sort of, a nice escape and you know pe people that work with Chaco are kind of nod at that and say yeah we can't explain Chaco well I think we can after a century and all that energy and work let's get out of Pueblo space that's the problem we've been limited by what we think is appropriate uh in Pueblo space you know not that a rituality or a pilgrimage center is anything Pueblos do these days but but it makes us feel like it's you know it's not it's still within our, the Santa Fe concept of Pueblo space, which are, you know, affects archaeologists. That's what we think is the appropriate to talk about. Well, how about Chaco as a polity, as a political system? And Lewis Henry Morgan said no. You know, a hundred years ago, he said no. They had no political systems in North of Mexico, so that's not been on the radar. Uh, seems like a possibility to me. So here's ten fun facts about Chaco that I think help us walk through this. Great houses were houses. That's the Benitos and Chapter Kettles and Altos and the big big buildings that you go to see in Chaco. If they weren't there, you wouldn't go to Chaco. Not many people lived in those great houses. People lived there, but not many people. And the people that were living there, number three, were special. They were different. Uh, the result of all this, and I'm going to go through these one at a time and explain what I'm thinking. Chaco was a class society with at least two different classes, um, nobles and commoners, which I'll get back to. Outliers, those little red triangles and squares and stuff on the map, they find a region of 35,000 square miles. So Chaco was the center of a region and the region was a system. It was, you know, it's not some random uh, uh, spotting of little red dots on a map. There's, you know, there's a structure to it and it works and so it, there's a function to it. And the region was uh, not small geographically um, and of some size. It included between 60 and 100,000 people. That's the region, not Chaco Canyon, but you know, that's a, that's a bunch of people. You know, you know, they're, I'll show you in a minute. They're spread out over 35,000 miles. It's not too many people per square mile, so it's not dense, but there's a lot of folks involved. And Chaco had bulk and prestige economies. They're moving big, heavy things all around, and they were moving, you know, the lighter, fancy things much further. Chaco was not a great place to farm. Um, you know, you're not going to keep the people eating in Chaco uh, by what you can grow in Chaco. And Chaco was very cosmopolitan. It wasn't inward looking at all. It, it's uh, very much engaged with. Like, most of the rest of North America at its time, 11th to 12th centuries. Okay, so great houses were houses. And we know this because they have these little things that the Park Service calls kivas, little round rooms. But kivas are domestic units. 
they're, they're part of a house. They're the, in fact, they are the thing that defines a house before, during, and after Chaco. This is what normal people lived in. Um, this is before Chaco and left at, I believe, is Duckfoot site. Uh, Ricky Lightfoot excavated up near Crow Canyon. And that's a house. Um, duck, you know, four rooms and a, and a pit structure out front. Um, and that actually begins back in Basket Maker. This will be pit Pueblo 1, uh, for those of you that are keeping score with the Pecos system. During Chaco in the 11th and 12th century, everybody else, uh, you know, it's not living in great houses, they're living in these things, four rooms and a pit structure. That's half of the BC site that uh, Gordon Vivian excavated, which are, you know, two little uh, unit, we call them unit pueblos, four rooms and a kiva, four or five rooms and a kiva. Although the kiva's not a kiva, the kiva's a pit structure. Um, the archaeologists made this mistake back in the, geez, in the 30s, uh, that they, you know, they we called them kivas. They didn't come with a sign on them saying it's a kiva now. Uh, it's a pit structure. It's a fancy pit structure. Just as the rooms get fancier, or you know, the architecture is more permanent. Same with the pit structure. Uh, you know, go from uh, earth walls in the pit structure to masonry walls in the pit structure, and boom, it's a kiva. No, it's just a fancier pit structure. After Chaco, this is how normal normal people live: four rooms, excuse me, five rooms, and a pit structure with you know masonry walls, and you know we call that a kiva. That's a family house. That's you know the the key the round room, which I'll keep calling kivas because it's archaeology jargon, um, is actually a, a house and the rooms behind them are, are the pantry, and the storage areas, and you know, places where they do a little bit of living. And the, the earliest great houses out of Chaco, like Pueblo Benito and Pueblo Alto, show that same pattern of, of string of unit pueblos, uh, an arc of unit pueblos, Pueblo Benito, a line of unit pueblos with a pit structure out front, a kiva, uh, with four or five rooms back behind it associated with it. And this is like in the early 11th century. This is the first construction that you see. And there's probably more of those kivas uh, uh, around the front of Pueblo Alto. They just had some later buildings stacked on top of them. So I say there's not many people in great houses because the number of kivas equals the number of households. And yeah, a lot of them at Pueblo Benito, uh, not all of those are con contemporary. A lot of those are stuck in a later. Um, but a place like, uh, you know, Penasco Blanco, you've got six. Uh, and that's a big, that's a big building. The Chetra Kettle, you probably got four uh, that are original equipment and some that come in later. Um, place like Hongo Pavi, uh, second row down on the left, you got one, all right? So the extra rooms, what do you do with that? This is with Gigi. It's up Canyon. Two kivas. And I think this is, this is unambiguous. I mean, that's all you got there. Two kivas and all these little rooms that are so small you couldn't swing a cat in them. What are those? Uh, those little rooms are storage or warehouses. And, you know, they have their own five rooms or whatever for the people living in, you know, in the, the the uh, round rooms and the kivas are going to have their household storage, but all the rest of that stuff is, you know, the place is functioning as a, a large storage facility. How do I know that? Well, because I crawled all over this buildings back in the day and drew every stinking wall and looked at the doors. You know, that uh, Wajiji's unexcavated, but we can, we can see three or four stories of, of architecture. And the doors that were leading into all those rooms were storage doors, which if you go out to Chaco, sometimes people call them windows. They're they're a couple of feet off the floor and they're small and, you know, you can only go through them head first. Um, this is one that I dug at Pueblo Alto uh, in black and white. And they, they almost all originally have these sort of secondary jams. You can see on the, on the upper right picture, there's this uh, jam that's, that's uh, slanted uh, into the space from which you would be moving. And that's a storage facility. Now, how do I know that? Because that's what you see in all the little granaries up, you know, 500 feet above the canyon bottom in southeastern Utah, southwestern Colorado. These tiny little uh, granaries that nobody's living in those. I mean, they're, they're small. They have doors with exactly the same kind of uh, um, arrangement that you could put a, a slab of wood or stone, usually, on that. And you, then you mud it all up around the edges of it and you cork the bottle. Whatever's behind that is, you know, critters aren't going to get into it. And you get, you get into it when you want to, but it's not easy. Right? It's not to facilitate traffic, it's to eliminate anybody or anything getting into what you're storing. You know, what are they storing? I have no idea, but those are storage room doors. And that's what you see all through those great houses, except for you know where people are actually living. Then you have tea doors, doors that a human being could walk through, but there are very few of those. Great house people were special. Uh, we know from their remains um, that they were bigger than other folks and they were healthier than other folks. And the women didn't have squatting facets uh, that the women at the uh, young women at uh, other um, normal people, commoners, had squatting facets because they spent so much time squatting, grinding corn. 
And when you're younger, young girl or young person, uh, and you're doing that work for a few hours a day, many hours a day, uh, it actually leaves marks on your bones. And at great houses, those women didn't have those. They had, they had people that grind their corn for them. And of course, they buried with pomp and circumstance. I mean, there's amazing burials out of Pogo Benito that uh, archaeologists from outside the Southwest look at that and go, oh, yeah, you got kings. Inside the Southwest, you know, there are no, are no kings in public space, so we think of other ways to explain them, but it's pretty obvious to archaeologists who do not operate in public space. Chaco was a stratified class society. You had, on one side of the canyon, you had Polo Benito in the 11th century. You walk across the bridge to the other side of the canyon, and you see the, what they call the BC sites, which are in the lower right there, about to the same scale. It's a whole string of little unit pueblos and normal people housing, and they're contemporary. Some people are living in the little unit pueblos and other people are living in the great big palaces. And it's just, it's textbook. Uh, in fact, you know, people around the world who would like to work with Chaco are, are using this in classes and textbooks. So, oh yeah, here's a, you know, an easy way to tell you got a stratified society with nobles and commoners. Nobles and commoners, or nobles at least, uh, that's not in pueblo space. I mean, you use that word in the Southwest and people throw stuff at you. But Every society, every corn growing society, every agricultural society north of Panama in Chaco's time and later uh, had nobles and commoners. I mean, there were some exceptions, but in North America from, from the Chumash, who are not agricultural, they're hunters and gatherers, the Calusa, who are also, you know, very rich maritime hunters and gatherers in Florida, you know, uh, were remarkably divided into nobles and commoners. And in the Mississippi Valley, the places like Cahokia, uh, and these big Mississippian cities, had nobles and commoners. And so Chaco is surrounded by nobles and commoners. It would be extraordinary if it didn't have, have that class structure. But in Pueblo space, you know, that shall not pass. Well, I'd say the heck with Pueblo space. The outliers defined the Chaco's region, you know, as part of these great outlier hunts in the 80s. Um, and yet you know, we started, you know, running around looking at these things. They, they have a pattern. You have a, a small great house, which sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. I mean, they're built the same way as Pueblo Benito. They just, it's not as big as Pueblo Benito. And, you know, they, you know, they aren't unit Pueblos. Uh, like normally, there are probably unit Pueblos in this aerial, and you just can't see them. I and mean, commoner housing is pretty subtle. And you're often surrounded by a berm, circular berm. You can see, you know, with roads going in and out. And, and you know, I haven't seen all of these. There's 150 or 100, maybe 200 of them. I've probably seen half of them. And you know, I sing one, you sing them all. I mean, there's, you know, it's a it's a pattern that repeats the berms, the great house, usually a great kiva someplace, roads, um, you know, from from Bluff, Utah down to Magdalena, New Mexico, and from Pagosa Springs, you know, down to, well, maybe all the way up to, to Flagstaff. Um, it's very repetitive. You know, they have different stones available, so you know, they they look a little different, but but the pattern's there, and it's a real pattern. This is not a coincidence. I mean, this is a pattern that's being imposed on the region. It's not a pattern that's growing up organically from the region. So, you know, there's the region, all those little squares and dots and all that kind of stuff. And like say, I've lost track and it depends on who you're talking to, but at least 150 of these things and probably more like, you know, probably more like 200. And there's more out there that we haven't found, but yeah, not too many. Chaco's region was a system. You know, you had the road network. And in this map, the red lines are Roads that are known or pretty uh, safely projected. Not the red, uh, there's the red polygon that outlines the region, but the, the red lines like the ones radiating out from Chaco, um, those are roads. And again, they go from as far north as you can get to, uh, they're underreported down south around Zuni, but they're there. Um, when we don't, we know, we know or only a few of these are that have been heavily, they're hard to see. This, this part of the archaeology is not easy. These are hard to see, uh, and we haven't thrown the money at them that we did back in the, in the 80s when the Bureau of Land Management threw a lot of money at some of the roads in the San Juan Basin, which is why we know so much about those, and not elsewhere. But there's also a line of sight communication system, all right, that parallels the roads. And I got to work at Chimney Rock in 2009 with Brenda Todd and, and a crew from University of Colorado. If you've never been to Chimney Rock, go. It's, it's cool. You have a great house up on a ridge overlooking a community of unit pueblos. I mean, it's just classic. And a great kiva down there that seems to be associated with the unit pueblos, not with the grace house. Um, don't know roads, but it's up in the mountains, so be, uh, in the forest. I mean, really hard to see roads. Um, what you can see from just from that spot uh, on the ridge, on the knife edge ridge, if you went 100 meters either way, you wouldn't be able to see this. Is looking down the Piedra River, you can see Werfano, Werfano Butte, which is a landmark all through northern northern San Juan Basin. 
Um, you know, it's very distinctive. You can, it's a holy place for Navajo people and probably obviously a very important place for, for uh, uh, Chaco as well. And excuse me, from Chimney Rock, one of the things that was excavated there in the 20s was a big square firebox about the size of a kid's sandbox. It was just cherry red outside the building. Is that, you know, um, actually right behind where I'm standing when I take this picture. Um, and, you know, they're not toasted marshmallows in that. It's, uh, it's something where they're burning big fires. And you can see where this is leading. On, on Huerfano Mesa, there are more of those fireboxes. There's no Pueblo there. There's no great house. There's no reason to have one there. It's a you know, horrible, not, not horrible, but it's a badlands. It's a place where you couldn't grow corn if you wanted to um, around the base of it. And there's big fireboxes there. So there's people up there doing stuff, but you know, there's not a great house. There's not a community. Well, when we were working at Pueblo Alto in Chaco, you look to the north and you can see where Fomino Mesa are on the skyline there. And, uh, you know, that's that dominated the uh, northern skyline. And in Alto, there is big fireboxes with, you know, bright red. So you've got them at, at Pueblo Alto at Chaco Canyon and on where Fomino Mesa and then up at Chimney Rock. And it, it's a signaling system. If you saw the Hobbit movies, uh, you might remember the Beacons of Gondor, where they had this series of uh, beacons and repeater stations, right? Because you can't see Chimney Rock from Chaco, but you can see Werfano. And you can't see Chaco from Chimney Rock, you can see Werfano. So there's a repeater station in between, which somebody had to be there to pick up the phone and, and you know, light the fire when it was time to light the fire. That's why I'm saying it's a system, it's integrated. And it also works for Farview and Mesa Verde, which is a Chaco great house. You can't see Chaco from Farview, but you can see Werfano. So, you know, the this is the best attested part of the line of sight system, but I'm pretty confident that it extended all different directions from Chaco. Every time you go on a, um, a visually central landform where you can see a lot of stuff and a lot of other great houses, there's a, there's a shrine or a firebox or something like that up there. Okay, so lots of people in the region, 60,000 minimum and probably more like 100,000 people in the region. And at Ch not at Chaco, I mean, Chaco is like 2,500 people, something like that which is big enough to be a city uh, in the ancient world. You know, we think of cities as being Manhattan or Paris or something, but no, you know, cities are, they're small. It's the function of, of the settlements, not the size. I'll get to that in a minute. But, you know, the 100,000 people, or, uh, you know, if you divide that by the number of square miles in Chaco's region, it's only a couple of people per square mile. They, they're in clusters around those great houses, the outlying great houses. That's where everybody's clustered. And in total, it comes out to 100,000, but they're, distances between them. So that's why you think why you have roads and signaling systems. So you can control all that stuff um, from, from the center of Chaco. Uh, and the economies, bulk and prestige economies, uh, things moved into Chaco in large quantities. I mean, heavy stuff. Uh, what, and people, uh, labor, I mean, it's not a pilgrimage center, but uh, the people that lived in the great houses in Chaco didn't build them. Um, there wouldn't be enough for starters. And they weren't that kind of people. They had people to do the, you know, the, the nobles had people to do that labor for them. So, you know, there's some kind of uh, seasonal uh, labor tax or something where they're bringing people in in large quantities and feeding them and, and building those buildings. And to build the buildings, they need beams, you know, hundreds of thousands of telephone poles being carried across the desert. Uh, and I've got names next to these that are, are people that have done the most interesting recent work. I won't go into what that work is, but you know, sourcing where the beams came from. That's just Christopher Gitterman. And pottery, you know, by the end of Chaco, you probably never were making much pottery there because there's nothing to fire it with. I mean, you'd be using whatever wood you had at Chaco would be going in the fire pits. And they'd probably have to bring that in from a long way. Uh, you certainly wouldn't waste it on pottery because it takes a lot of, of fuel to uh, fire pots. So the pottery is coming from uh, mostly from the West, but from all over. And by the height of Chaco in the early 12th century, you probably all the pottery, almost all the pottery is not being made at Chaco. And I, I would bet that all the pottery is, I will, takes a plunge here and say, none of the pottery is being made of chocolate. It's all being brought in. That's bulk stuff. That's what I'm talking about, bulk economies coming in from 60, 70 miles away, like the beams. Uh, corn, uh, you know, this is this is a little iffier, but uh, you can chemically trace where corn was grown. And the pioneering work on that was my friend, Larry Benson here in, in Boulder, who analyzed uh, strontium levels in, in corn. And yeah, it wasn't being grown in Chaco, it was being grown over where they, Makes sense, you know, along the San Juan River or at the base of the Chuscas where there's water coming out of the mountains. And meat, uh, Deanna Grimstead did similar sort of analysis of the large package stuff, the, the sides of deer and elk and whatever that the, the nobles are eating. And it's being brought in 
which shouldn't surprise us because people living in Chaco for a long time and anything with four legs, you know, bigger than a, a bunny uh, would be long gone. But yeah, they're bringing in meat long distances. So that's a bulk economy. The prestige economy, turquoise, Chaco is famous for being sort of in control of turquoise, not just from Cerritos and Santa Fe, but from all over the place. There's a couple of different projects that are sourcing turquoise at Chaco. And a lot of sticks. I mean, a lot of everything I'm talking about so far is stuff coming into Chaco. It's like taxes, all right? You know, the, the center, to maintain the center, you need to bring it food, you need to bring, you know, to keep the, com the nobles happy, you need to bring them stuff. It's, it's sticking in Chaco. And when you get to prestige economies, I think there's stuff that's coming back out of Chaco. Um, turquoise probably going south to Mexico, but going other places too. It gets worked in Chaco. We know there are many turquoise workshops in Chaco where they uh, they bring the turquoise in from Cerritos and other places, work it up into Tesserae or whatever, and then ship it back out again. But uh, they're sending stuff out, but with stuff coming into Chaco from far away, but they're also Chaco sending stuff out to its dependencies. Um, certainly a lot of that's Spondylus upper left, which is you know practically it's a, almost a South American. Uh, mollusk. It, it, it extends up the Pacific coast a ways. Copper from West Mexico, and that's a, a obviously a painting of a, a copper bell, a little copper bell. Um, Hohokam, the lower left, is a Hohokam cotton shirt that they found at Chetra Kettle. It's very distinctive, and you know how Hohokam wove those things. And then coming back out, um, this is at the edge of the Cedars Museum in southeastern Utah in Blanding. It's a macaw feather. You know, they had macaws. I didn't talk about that. And they had cacao coming from the south, you know, coming from Mexico. I mean, into Chaco. And at Chaco, they, they fashion the, probably at Chaco, uh, somewhere, somewhere that is not in Mexico, they're fashioning this sash out of macaw feathers because uh, it's on a local, it's on a Southwestern squirrel, somebody's tasseled squirrel pelt uh, is, is the uh, heart of the thing. And so, yeah, I think that, that was found near, not near, but in a cave, uh, somewhat near. The Bluff Great House, and that's the sort of thing that I think Chaco is sending out to the secondary nobility out in the countryside as badges of office. So the prestige economies go much further than the bulk economies. Okay, not a good place to farm. Um, there's a Navajo standing in front of what looks like Iowa, uh, and they probably took the picture because that's the one year the crop actually came in at Chaco. Uh, it's just not a good place to farm, and everybody that's looked at this since the dawn of time, after Edgar Hewitt anyway, uh, it says, you know, shakes their head, and there is a, a group of scholars who insist that no, it was a good place to farm, and there's half a dozen of them, and you know, they're smart people, and they're doing passable work, uh, you know, it's, it, it gets in, in journals and stuff, and then there's everybody else that takes one look at the place and looks at you know, other uh, analyses of soils and drainage and stuff and say, no, nah, I don't think so. I'm not, um, I don't have the skills and the training to evaluate which of those two camps is right, so what I trust is, well, it's what did human beings actually do there? And the Navajos were living all over, not all over, living all over Chaco in historic times until the Park Service ran them out. And uh, I asked Dave Brugge, who is the um, Dean of Navajo Historians for that area, you know, at most, how many Navajos ever lived out there? And Brugge said a couple hundred, maybe, maybe a few hundred max, absolutely. And almost all those guys had farms elsewhere too. They had, you know, had a, a place in Chaco and then they had a farm up in the Chuscas where they actually kept their flocks and stuff and where they grew corn. Um, so, you know, they were, they were uh, uh, not dependent on what they could produce at Chaco because Chaco wouldn't produce much. So I, I don't think there's the resources at Chaco to support more than a couple hundred people. Uh, doesn't mean they weren't growing corn there, uh, but I bet it was special corn for special purposes. And what they're eating is coming in from the Chusca Valley and, and other places. I know it's cosmopolitan. I mean, I, I mentioned this before. You had macaws, you had spondylus. That's uh, one in the upper right before it gets worked. And the copper bells and cacao, uh, Patty Crown and UNM discovered cacao. And then she turned around and discovered um, yop and holly, which is lower right, which is a highly caffeinated berry and leaf uh, that you drink. Um, it's not your morning pick me up. It's your morning knock me out. I mean, it, you know, you see things. Uh, and it, it's the American Gulf Coast, or Southeastern Gulf Coast, but it was everywhere in uh, the Mississippi Valley, uh, among the cities and the nobles in Mississippi Valley drank this stuff, and it got to Chaco. So it wasn't just Mexico that, that Chaco was dealing with, they were dealing with the Mississippi Valley and Cahokia and, and those guys were exactly contemporary with Chaco. Um, here's a bonus fact, uh, Chaco was urban, it's a capital city, you know, 
it's between two three thousand people that's the size of an aztec provincial capital not not tenochtitlan uh you know the aztec M imperial capital but the, the smaller provincial capitals that's about the size they were and uh, their capitals were a mix of palaces and commoner houses and ceremonial structures the key is that uh, a city um you know doesn't have to be a certain size it has to have people in it obviously in some massive architecture but a, a good definition of a city is a center that transforms its region or serves its region and Chaco was definitely that it was permanent lasted you know almost three centuries and it was big um you know 100 hectares uh, over 200 acres just for the downtown part and you know that's bigger than a lot of things that are called cities elsewhere in the world and people that study cities all right you know don't take my word for it but people that actually study cities and know what they're talking about like amos rapaport and uh i'm again i'm unable to read the bottom line there roland fletcher i hope is what the name i have there or guys that you know the best cross-cultural pre-industrial studies best um most comprehensive studies of pre-industrial cities across cultures and times are those those guys and they both you know it's a capital it's a city they, they don't even think twice about it but not the people who work in public space you say it's a city the people who work in public space and you know they throw stuff at you um we're around the home stretch here so it's planned uh, uh john fritz figured this out back in the god in the 60s 70s that there's a, a symmetry to chaco a north south axis from from pueblo alto on, on the north mesa to sincletson on the south mesa and uh, the big buildings the palaces which i'm calling palaces which anybody else didn't work in public space would call them palaces that that's what they are they're masses of storage high-end uh you know large uh, uh floor area residences specialized rooms da, 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 da. that's a palace um and those palaces are arranged symmetrically uh you know not randomly um around there with it answering to um celestial principles like north south and maybe lunar stuff as in a, in a um, solstice project. Uh, you know, so Fair's work is pretty convincing. Um, so yeah, it's got a layout like, you know, most capital cities. Uh, so yeah, and with a half a dozen, really, you know, there's a bunch of things that are built in the style of great houses there, but there's three, really only half a dozen uh, big ones, real big ones that have time depth. You know, they built a whole bunch of stuff right at the end when the wheels are coming off that they, nobody was even living in it. Um, so the mystery. If you're working in Pueblo space, this is a common complaint. It says no models from ethnography works for Chaco. You know, nothing that we can look at from North America, uh, the tribes that were encountered by ethnologists in North America, works for Chaco. And even if you go elsewhere uh, among societies that are uh, we think are comparable to Pueblos that are egalitarian, this and that and the other. You can't find, you can't cut and paste anything from ethnography that works for Chaco. Lynn Sebastian, who is a very, very smart person, who uh, worked with me on uh, the Chaco Synthesis Project, wrote that if we haven't found a box for Chaco, we probably haven't looked at enough boxes. Meaning if we haven't found some way to understand Chaco, we probably need to look further because Chaco shouldn't be a mystery. It shouldn't be an anomaly. It's late in North American prehistory. It's 1000 AD. You know, by 1000 AD, there had been civilizations in Mexico from 1200 BC. I mean, they tried all kinds of stuff and they worked it out. And there's probably just a, a limited number of options. So nothing in the ethnography of Pueblo space works for Chaco. Well, let's get out of Pueblo space. You know, let's look south of the border, which Bandelier said there's no point in doing that. Uh, Lewis Henry Morgan said, no, absolutely no. But Carl Sauer, who's a historical geographer that I admire, uh, never met the man, I admire from uh, Berkeley, who looked at this stuff, and I'm going to have to call it up here so I can read it. Um, he, he didn't work in Pueblo space. He wasn't an ethnographer. He's a geographer, all right? So he got out from under Lewis Henry Morgan, and he got out from under Bandelier, and he got out from under Hewitt. He didn't, you know, he knew those guys, but, you know, he wasn't. Uh, compelled to believe what they were saying. And he said the notion of independence and isolation of the Southwest would not have arisen, it seems to me, if historically Mexico had been the center from which anthropological studies had spread into North America instead of Boston or Washington or New York. That if Mexican archaeologists had moved north out of Mexico and, and studied Chaco, they wouldn't have big problems with it. They wouldn't be terribly impressed, to tell you the truth. They wouldn't think it was, you know, any great shakes, not compared to Tenochtitlan or 
Teotihuacan or, uh, um, you know, any of the other major centers down there and chocolate small potatoes, but they would recognize it and it wouldn't phase them. It wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a stinking mystery. So yeah, Chaco, if we expand, if we get out of public space, forget public space and say the continent, you know, what was Chaco's place in time? You know, what was its world? Not the world we're trying to push it in, uh, push on it. Um, the Chaco is contemporary with what's called the early post-classic of Mesoamerica, which is Tula and, and it's, it's what happens in, in central Mexico after the, the, when they're recovering from the fall of Teotihuacan, which probably also the fall of Teotihuacan influenced uh, events in the Southwest, almost certainly. The people in the Southwest and the Mississippi Valley, they knew about the post-classic, how could they not? I mean, we, we that, that international boundary between the US and Mexico is so pernicious and so counterproductive in thinking about the, the prehistoric past. It wasn't there at 1000 AD. These people all knew what you know was going on down there. And, you know, the especially the rulers. It's the job of the rulers, the, the nobles, to know what's going on out in other places. They they knew there were cities down there. They probably went down there and visited them, uh, and vice versa. You know, Mesoamerica probably knew that Chaco was up here. And there's sources of cotton, which is prized. There's uh, sources of copper, um, turquoise. You know, there's stuff up north that in, interested those guys. So if you look. In the Mesoamerican literature, I started doing this, uh, looking at the Aztec Empire, right? And, and no, that level, you know, Chaco was not that. Um, those models don't work for Chaco. But when you learn a little more about this stuff, and I, I got mentored on this by my good friend, Gerardo Gutierrez, that the Aztec Empire uh, was composed of a bunch of little polities. That's what makes it an empire. The Aztecs took over, the Mexica Aztecs took over uh, smaller polities many of which had a uh, fairly distinctive government structure called an El Tepetl. And you say that in Nahua, and a Nahua speaker would not say El Tepetl. I mean, I don't speak Nahua. Um, but it's a form of government that was pretty well described during colonial times because it persisted. The Spanish didn't eliminate the local governments. They used them. You know, they just made sure that whoever, however the local government was working, that they paid their taxes and, you know, supplied the labor and that kind of stuff. And El Tepetl, and this is combining work of several Mesoamerican scholars consists of nobles and commoners, you know, with half a dozen noble families and rotating kingship. You know, they, each family, noble family has a palace and there's a king, but the king, when the king dies, his, it's not his son or daughter that becomes the, the ruler. All the heads of uh, the houses, heads of the noble families get together and broker a new king. And it's never from the same house as the old king. And that keeps, you know, what any one family from, it prevents any one family from taking over. So rotating kingship. The Altepetl is both the city and the countryside integrated. Uh, it's a center and a hinterland, um, but that's, that's important. You can't have a, you know, a city state, it's all by itself. And the, the countryside pays tribute and taxes and not necessarily onerous taxes, you know, a couple bushels of corn or, you know, I own a week of labor or something like that. And they, they pay that, those taxes to the secondary nobility, which is out in the countryside. And the secondary nobility, you know, sends their taxes and tribute into the half a dozen noble families. In the cities, you know, this is uh, Mike Smith's work. I forget the name of the, a couple of scholars that the city capitals are three to 5,000 people. Are the capitals of these El Tepetals, this is about Chaco size, right? And the polity itself is 30 to 50,000 people, which is about Chaco size. And you know, Chaco's uh, region at, at a minimum was 60,000 people. But the, uh, the difference is El Tepetl was much smaller in geographic extent because you can grow a lot of corn, <laughs> a lot more corn in central Mexico and, you know, uh, on an acre of land than you can on uh, any given acre of the San Juan Basin where you probably can't grow corn at all. That's it. Chaco is, it, it fits the scale except for the geography where Chaco is much bigger than El Tepetl because the farming lands are not continuous. It's not like Iowa. You have good farming here, good farming there, good farming there. And the areas in between are, are kind of wastelands. So it's spread out uh, to mirror the, the productivity of the land. So this is a diagram of an El Tepetl that combines several people's work. Uh, looks like a pizza pie uh, with the half a dozen major uh, no, you know, principal families uh, in the capital city in the center, which is an aggregate. And the little uh, smaller hexagons are the provincial uh, capitals out in the uh, territory for the people that owe tribute to a particular family in the capital. And then the little round dots are commoner houses. And the commoner houses are interspersed in all this stuff. There's commoner houses in between palaces in the, in the capital. There's each one of the outer uh, uh, 
I keep going to tip my hand and say great houses. The smaller palaces around the countryside are surrounded by uh, farming villages and stuff like that. Okay, well, that fits charcoal like a glove. You know, the complaint is there's no model from ethnography that fits charcoal. That works just fine. In the center city is just like charcoal, half a dozen, you know, principal families, uh, each for the a territory, um, which might have probably are defined by those roads radiating out like spokes on a wheel. And then, of course, the, the whole territory is like Chaco with these outlying great houses and surrounded. That's where the, the uh, agricultural production is actually taking place is out in the city. And I mentioned all this stuff going into Chaco, um, beams and all the labor and food and this and that and staying in Chaco. That's tribute. That's taxes. And it might be dressed up, you know, on some ceremonial or, you know, you could put a religious gloss on it if you want to. But that basically is functioning like tribute and taxes. It is tribute and taxes. So, you know, we got this Chaco's got nobles and commoners. It's got certainly got half a dozen, you know, noble families uh, that are seem to be relatively equal in, in uh, power. Rotating kingship can't demonstrate that, but I'm hearing stuff from Native American people. It sounds like, yeah, okay, that's what was going on out there. I'll get back to that in a minute. And the tribute and taxes, I was talking about that, that a lot of stuff gets sucked into Chaco, which you know, people say, well, that's a rituality that would do it. Well, yeah, so would a political system. <laughs> you know, if you got taxes and tribute, that's what it would look like. Stuff would be going in and some stuff would be coming out. And it's the same, it's the right scale. So we're never going to understand Chaco and Pueblo space. If you got outside Pueblo space, I don't think Chaco is all that. It's not mysterious and it's certainly understandable um, in the terms of its time and its place. I'm not saying that Chaco was an El Tepetl. I'm just saying that that model which may be earlier Chaco actually than it is down south, that that model is known from Chaco's you know, continent in Chaco's timeline and it's, it's, Chaco was something like that. I'm sure it had its own history, its own spin on how that worked, but it was something like that where you have a number of noble families, half dozen noble families in a capital city in some way in charge of a, you know, transforming and serving a, a region. And if you, if you took Chaco down south, you know, its architecture would be different, but its structure would not phase a Mexican archaeologist at all. They, they, oh, that, we know what that is. That's this. And I think, I think that's it. So I'd like to thank you all for tuning in and thank the uh, Ameren Foundation for putting this together. And I, Ameren is great. It's a great institution. You know, I think you probably know that or you wouldn't be listening, but uh, it can't hurt for me to urge you to support the Amerind. Write them a check um, so they can keep doing stuff like fun stuff like this. So thanks very much. And I'll turn it back to Annie. Thank you so much, Steve. We have quite a few questions. For those of you who have your hands raised, if you would please type your um, question or comment in the Q&A box, we will try to um, get to your question or comment. Um, my first question is, um, <clears throat> Regarding the scholarly debate as to why the people of Chaco Canyon left, um, once a uh, side argued, did they leave the cliff dwellings out of fear that the Central American natives would use them for slaves? Or was it a very extended drought that drove them from Chaco Canyon? Um, I don't get into this, but Chaco doesn't end at Chaco. They moved the capital north to a place called Aztec Runs. And yeah, I proposed this 20 years ago and people wanted to hang me from the nearest tree, but now this is, you know, pretty much accepted by all the Southwestern archaeologists. The Chaco, uh, they quit building at Chaco in 1110 or something like that, and they moved the capital up to the Aztec, and it's a, a smaller capital, um, but it continues to be the regional center. And that's the regional center when people are living in cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde. Uh, people aren't living in cliff dwellings during Chaco's time because it's peaceful time, uh, at least as far as the evidence of the architecture goes. You don't have cliff dwellings, you don't have walled villages and stuff like that. But the wheels come off when they when they move the capital up north. Uh, it's not that Chaco is forgotten. I mean, they're still doing stuff at Chaco. It's still an important place, but the, the administrative center moves north. And where Chaco, during Chaco's run, it rained, which is, you know, that's what the leaders are supposed to do, make it rain. And it was relatively peaceful. I mean, there was some violence, but it's a, get into that later, but it wasn't warfare violence. During Aztec's period, the successor capital, they couldn't pull that off. It quit raining. You know, the nobles aren't doing their jobs. It quit raining. And uh, there's warfare. You know, we're pretty clearly warfare of one village on another. And that's when you get people moving up into the cliffs. 
Um, they're not worried about people coming up from Mexico. They're worried about the guys in the next next valley over, um, possibly because they, you know, they don't have enough to eat or whatever. But they, you know, there really are sites that are uh, sacked, and you know, the archaeologists digging. And there's people lying around with arrowheads and that kind of stuff. Uh, the human remains, you know, they're clearly dispatched by by violence. And people start leaving um, as early as the 1220s. There's whole villages just getting up and saying, "This stinks. It's not working anymore." Uh, we're leaving and they move south. I excavated part of a Mesa Verde migrant village almost almost on the Mexican border in southern New Mexico. Uh, and they're leaving and, and I'm emphasizing they leave, start leaving the 1220s, 1230s, 1240s because actually times are good then. It's, it's raining again. All right. Uh, there's a big drought right after Aztec opens up shop that, that kind of throws things at Kilter. But those are those are good times. And they're leaving. They're leaving when it's raining because the political system is is falling apart. Political system's not operating anymore. It's a political decision to leave. The, the commoners can vote with their feet. And while I think the nobles try to use force on them a little bit, it doesn't work. And the commoners move to where, in big numbers, move to where the Pueblos are today uh, and join their friends there, their kins, you know, like Hopi and Zuni and Ackerman and rolling the Rio Grande. But I, like I said, they also move further, you know, way far south and may or may not come back to the north. Then, okay, after most of the places is emptied out, then there's a big drought from 1275 to 1300. It's kind of the exclamation point on it. And that's what, you know, everybody goes and, and, you know, as far as archaeologists can tell, there's nobody living up there. At least nobody is building things that archaeologists can see. I hope that answered the question. All right. And have they tried using LIDAR to find additional roads um, that you had mentioned? Yes. Yeah, there's um, Anna Sofair uh, used LIDAR on the North Road. We sort of knew where the North Road was, but the, the LIDAR brought out some really interesting stuff we didn't know about is you know, like four parallel roads and stretches, things like that. And the Bureau of Land Management um, threw a bunch of money at LIDAR, uh, somewhat, well, it was connected with the uh, uh, leasing of um, fracking sites in the San Juan Basin. And there are, there are uh, smaller, or, um, but still very important, uh, ongoing research projects that are using LIDAR. I, I mentioned that, you know, we have these maps that show where roads are or where we think roads are. And some of those roads, you know, got a lot of attention back in the 80s, pre larda and you mapped them and, and we know where those are. And we're almost you know, really certain that there's more roads out there, but we don't know where they are. And this is why it's kind of uh, important. You know, I want to get too political here, but the, the area around Chaco is being, has been leased. Um, mostly, and it's more of it's being leased for for fracking. And you know, good luck finding roads after you have well pads and access roads and pipelines and all that kind of stuff disturbing the surface. I mean, roads are hard to see, and you park that that kind of development on top of it, you you just forget about the roads being seen any more roads. So there's a big push to use a lot of lar a lot of lidar fast, which is hard to say because it works works really well. And would you discuss the Chaco Meridian and your current thinking on that? Uh, that's a whole other lecture. Um, Chaco Meridian is a book I published 20 years ago that said Chaco moved north to Aztec and then south to Pacume, Casas Grandes. And I published a second edition about five years ago that in, in north south, that's the Chaco, that's a meridian. And that, that meridian meant something to them, that it was, you know, it legitimized Aztec because it was due north of Chaco. Don't ask me why, but that. You know, clearly they did it, and one has to assume that it meant something. Um, and that one, like I said uh, earlier, when 20 years ago, that was controversial, but today, yeah, Chaco moved to Aztec. I mean, it's in the textbooks. The next move down to Pacume is still meeting much resistance, but um, in the intervening time, I discovered that between the first edition and second edition, that that north-south alignment goes back 500 years before Chaco um, in 500 AD. The biggest, I can't get into all this because we'll be here all afternoon. It's another lecture. Invite me back. I'll give you the other lecture. But there's time periods in Southwest that uh, called the Pecos systems, Pueblo 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever, that were, those are devised, you know, in 1927, I believe. We still use them because, you know, the guys in 27 are pretty smart. Um, for each of those time periods, which are, you know, an archaeologist, we can agree that they're different. You know, there's enough differences that, oh, yeah, we're in Pueblo 2 now or we're in Pueblo 3 now. For each one of those time periods, the biggest by far and the weirdest by far and 
the most interesting, and I can actually measure these things, that the uh, most interesting and most important sites are on that meridian for each one of those time periods, up to Chaco, and then after Chaco at Aztec, and after Chaco at Casas Grandes. And after Casas Grandes, which ends at 14, 1450, again, this whole other lecture, but there's good reason to believe that they, they head further south to Culiacan, you know, right over the Sierra Madre, um, which, oh, they couldn't have done that. Well, yeah, they could. And it's just a question of time. Uh, they, they clearly, everybody accepts that Chaco moved north to Aztec. And they left a road between the two that show, you know, shows it on the ground. I mean, it's, that's unambiguous. So they had the ability to do it. The question is, you know, why on earth would you do it? And, you know, would you have the time and the patience and the, and the resources to do it over these long distances? I think they did. So, that, yeah, that's where Chaco Meridian sits right now. Uh, uh, if you want to read that, um, get it through interlibrary loan. <laughs> it's the second edition of Chaco Meridian came out in 2015. And would you provide your understanding of the Bahada, Bahada Butte Sun Dagger and your understanding of the remarkable similarity of working sun daggers throughout the American Southwest? I can't answer that one. I mean, uh, um, you know, Anna Sofer and the Solstice Project uh, researched that back in the 70s or something, and, and she's got a very active research program still. And you know, continue to work on that. Uh, without sounding like I'm belittling it, I mean, it's it's a calendrical system, right? You had to, it, it keeps track of the through, through both the sun and the moon of where you are in the calendar. Which these these guys, the guys at Chaco probably aren't farmers, but the guys that are keeping them alive are. Right? So, if you're a farmer in an arid environment or in any kind of temperate zone or, or arid environment, you have to know the calendar. I mean, this isn't like some mysterious, oh, isn't this amazing thing? It's like, yeah, you have to know the calendar. I mean, you're, you're dead if you don't, because uh, you, you have to plant crops, you have to, you know, you have to cycle your year. And it, it gets all more complicated than that, because, you know, there's a ceremonial cycles and everything else that, that, are, that are yearly. So, you know, having a calendar, having a, um, you know, there's different ways of doing it, but, but having uh, a technology like the sun dagger sites or whatever that keeps track of the year of, you know, the solstices, whatever, I forget what all they, they track, but they track uh, important landmarks, uh, date landmarks of the year uh, is really interesting, but uh, I wouldn't say it, how shall I say this? I mean, it's expectable almost. I mean, if it wasn't that, it'd be something else. You know, they, they do something with a horizon or something so they know what time of the, you know, where they are in the year. And, and having lived there for thousands and thousands of years, they'd have a pretty good sense of when the first, when the frost come, and when you know, when the rains are going to come, you, if it's a good year, predictable year, and and peg that to their calendrical understanding. All right, and I think this will be our last one. My apologies, we have uh, well over seventy questions as well as people who have their hands raised, and I'm so sorry that we're not able to get to all of you. Our last question is. Um, how did indigenous community members participate in the framing of Chaco's history? As told by me, um, I'll, talk, I'll take that as the tone of the question is, you know, what did I, you know, what input am I getting from those guys? And I say those guys, cause you know, lots of friends and contacts and, and professional, uh, uh, you know, like museum related uh, interactions with folks. Um, I started thinking about Chaco outside Pueblo space when I was working in Museum New Mexico. And we were designing what they call the permanent exhibit in the uh, Museum of the Arts and Culture. Called Here Now Always. I was working with a team of three Pueblo people and two, me and another white guy, Bruce Bernstein, and then um, uh, Ted Hohola, who is, is Leda, uh, Ed Ladd, who's Zuni, and Rena Swensel, uh, and wonderful people. I mean, we brought in all kinds of folks, you know, all kinds of other Native American people, mostly Pueblos. And the Rio Grande guys were really interesting from the Rio Grande Pueblos. You know, the Hopis would have some story about Chaco and Zuni has some story about Chaco. And you get guys from the Rio Grande Pueblos and they would say, we know all about Chaco. We don't talk about it because bad things happened out there. And it's, oh, that was kind of a wake up moment that, yeah, it's, it's not, why am I assuming that it was a happy place? I don't think it was a happy place. And over the years, I'm getting more more contacts with 
just in the last few months, I'm getting emails from people who are, you know, reading, seeing me lecture or something like that, or reading my books or whatever. And Pueblo people, especially the Rio Grande people saying, yeah, it was a horrible place. We hate it. Uh, horrible things happened out there. Uh, you know, it, it was wonderful at the same time. Uh, that's an Acoma story that I've heard many different versions of that. It, and they call it White House. You know, it was an amazing place. They had all these macaws and all this stuff and drank chocolate and whatever. But people behave badly out there, meaning that people had power over people. They were not behaving like Pueblo people should behave in Pueblo space, at least. So it falls apart and they leave. Um, they vote with their feet. Increasingly, I'm getting this stuff from Navajo people too, who Navajo people lived on that land and they know they know a lot about that place. Um, and their stories are real specific I mean, to the point of saying, yes, there were six, to the point of saying, yes, there were six, six kings that were vying for power out there. And I was kidding, they're going, you know, this is not somebody who's read my stuff about Al Teppels. This is some, some guy's just telling me what, what he heard. And I'm thinking, that really, that works for me. <laughs> so I'm getting these hints that. And, and more than hints, you know, people telling me to my face that, yeah, I, you haven't got it right, but you're getting close. Um, and this is interesting because it, it's not a cheerful place necessarily. Uh, I have on a couple of occasions gotten a couple of people saying, yeah, you're not right, but you're getting close. And we don't want our kids hearing it from some white guy. And that's really interesting as an archaeologist because it's my job to figure things out as an archaeologist. I think I've figured some things out. Um, but, the, you know, it's not... It, it, it's being acknowledged that, that, yeah, I'm sort of close, but they really, you know, they, they want to tell their own people this story at the right time and place that they need to, or, or not tell the story, um, if, if that works. And, you know, that's a quandary. That's one of the reasons I retired. <laughs> so, you know, my job is to figure things out. I figured something out, probably got it close. You know, not obviously, I didn't get it right, but I got it close and it's uncomfortable for the descendants, some of the descendants of that. So that's, yeah, uh, Native people I've listened to and talked to and work, work with Native people, Navajos and Pueblos for decades. And, um, I didn't go out and conduct a poll or anything, uh, but I've certainly had many, many, many wonderful conversations, wonderful, both frightening and wonderful, you know, just really interesting um, about Chaco. And I think what I'm talking about certainly fits with what some of these people are saying. Well, thank you so much for spending your time with us today and sharing your knowledge with our audience, Steve. We truly appreciate it. And we probably will take you up on that offer to have you back sometime in the future. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you have a wonderful day and that you will join us on May 8th for our next program. Take care, everyone. Bye.